Good morning. A couple of things before we hold our Bibles up. This Wednesday night, men, we will have our men's fellowship. Uh, 7 o'clock, I want to encourage you to be here. It'll be an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And uh, it will kind of be a uh, second step to um, the men's breakfast, that kind of thing, where it's, it's fellowships, teaching, and it's going to help us all grow. Uh, so I want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday night. Also, those of you who have, well, those of you who haven't as well, we invite you just to, on your way out today, uh, to stop by, just walk by the garage, what we call the garage, which is going to be our new kids' worship area, youth. Uh, not quite finished, but the walls are up, stage is in, uh, all that stuff. So you get to walk by, and you get to see that. And uh, the, for those of you who've given, thank you so much. We wanted you to have just a, a quick look at what you've contributed to. Far from done. It'll be hopefully done by Easter. It's kind of our grand opening. And uh, we certainly appreciate those of you who have contributed above and beyond. It would not have been possible without you. And also, uh, tomorrow is a very special day. It's my beautiful wife's birthday, and I will not give her age. And so if you see her out there in the lobby somewhere, you might just say, Happy birthday, Mark is one lucky man. And you would be speaking truth, all right? Well, let's stand, hold our Bibles up high. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we begin a series on the cross. Um, it's, it's really, believe it or not, one of the most difficult topics to talk about. First off, an innocent man named Jesus was hung on a cross to take the place of all of us, past, present, future generations, an agonizing death. As a matter of fact, theologians suggest maybe it's one of the most horrid deaths anyone could die. And as we prepare to celebrate Easter, and I love the celebration of an empty tomb, a resurrected Savior, that everything Jesus said he would do, he did. I love that. However, if we don't take the journey, if you will, in our hearts and minds, and we don't share that journey of, of the cross, then to a small degree, if not a great degree, it diminishes the empty tomb. Because the reality is where there is no cross, there's no sacrifice, there's no atonement, there's no shed blood. Without the cross, we have no salvation. And so the Bible says, cursed is every man who's hanged on a tree. Now I'll get to that verse in just a moment, but first I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. And as we take a look at, at, at the cross, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, first off, you're going to see the cross on every continent around the world, you're going to see it in every nation. To some degree, you're going to see it in, in its crass, most crass form, sometimes in its most polished form. The, the symbol of the cross is the most recognizable symbol probably that there is on earth. At the same time, it's probably the most controversial symbol on earth. The reason for that, I believe, is that those of us, when we were lost without Christ, and those of us who were self-condemned, and those of us who had this low self-image and self-worth, couldn't possibly imagine that one man would die on the cross for our sin, our misery, our dysfunction, and everything else. So the thought of someone loving us that much was too much love, because I didn't love me. Those of you who are lost, you probably didn't love you. And as a result, you point to the symbol that's supposed to bring liberation, yet in the mind of a lost person, it brings 
condemnation. In other words, it just confirms to them they are as bad as they thought they were. And guess what? They were. We were. And that's why Jesus had to die on that cross. Because we were as bad as we thought we were. And that when someone loves us in the depths of our suffering, our sorrow, when we are at our worst... It's when it's hardest to receive what we need the most. Mankind was at that place thousands of years separated from God. And so when we see the cross today, we see it in so many different ways. We see it with diamond-crusted jewels, and we see it gold and platinum and silver, and it's so beautiful. But let me say this. I believe one of the reasons that Jesus didn't die on iron or metal was because the blood couldn't soak in. You see, the blood has to soak in. It has to soak into us. It has to had to soak into the cross. It had to be absorbed into that wooden, hideous, horrible tree. So the cross is controversial. I don't know how many of you have recently read the argument about World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center, that when it all everything happened at the World Trade Center when it blew up, that they found this cross, which to those of us who are believers said this is a sign of hope. As in the midst of this disaster, there's hope. And in the midst of every disaster, there is hope. And, and so because the cross was so meaningful to so many, They decided to put it outside. My understanding is World Trade Center 1, which I've been there, and and the controversy was it's a religious symbol. But then the argument by the pro-cross people was, no, it's a historic symbol. And so it remains. But let it become a religious symbol, and, and it's pushed aside. Let me say this. Christianity has to stand strong. When every other religion is getting buys and exemptions, we still fight for the cross that represents salvation to all mankind. We have to have an understanding of that cross. And it says in 2 Peter 1, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires." One of the purposes of the cross was not only to reveal the divine power of God, but to release that divine power into us. So it revealed, but it also released. And he said because of that divine power, we now have the opportunity to possess a divine nature. That means that We no longer are living or have to live under the authority of sin's power because of his divine power. I don't know how many of you remember Flip Wilson. You remember Flip? The devil made me do it. Devil can't make you do anything. Now, it was cute, and I don't think Flip meant anything by it. I mean, back in the day, he'd probably been killed if he had of, you know, as back in the day when Jesus was still quite honored. And so today, it's amazing how we can have conversations about Christ in, in such disparaging fashion and, and feel the liberty to say things that would have never been said in that generation. However, <clears throat> there are many people <clears throat> that if you don't understand the cross— And it's a very difficult thing to fully understand with our human mind. But the cross is what brought a shift in man's ability to fulfill the purpose of God in each and every life. 
the cross. It's not your skill set. It's not your intellect. It's none of those things. It's when we understand that the divine power of God is resident in us through his divine nature that we can now live a victorious life. However, let me say this. Had they not crucified him, we would not be celebrating a resurrected Jesus. We wouldn't celebrate Easter. We wouldn't celebrate this time of year. It required great pain in order to receive the great promise. And when I think about the cross, I oftentimes think of the great sacrifice that was made on my behalf. When I see a cross, it's not just a religious symbol. It's a life-changing piece of history. And I have no issue with people wearing them. I, matter of fact, it's a great conversational piece. Thank you, Brian. Great conversational piece. I've done this in the past. I'm a little older and wiser now and less likely to irritate people intentionally. Operative word is intentionally. But there was a time in my zealous young life when I'd see a cross around somebody's neck and I'd go up and say, what does that mean to you? Well, I thought it was pretty. Oh, okay, that's fine. It is pretty. Does it have any more meaning to you than that? I didn't want to be mean, but I just wanted to say, you know, why would you pick a cross if it had no meaning? And maybe it's born out of curiosity, and that's fine too. But the reality is, is that the cross was loaded with so much more than we could imagine. So let's, let's go to Colossians chapter 2. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. So hold it. The cross was a place of triumph. To everyone who saw him that day, it looked like a great place of defeat. But the Apostle Paul tells us it was a place of triumph. That one man would refuse to exercise his privilege, and this is Christ being the one who did not exercise his privilege because he looked down from the cross, if you'll recall, and he looked at the people and said, if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels to come and take me off of here. That statement need to be made, needed to be made and made uh, canonized so that we could understand that Jesus did this willingly, not powerlessly. He still had full power on the cross to come off the cross, but he stayed on the cross so that you and I could live life. In the weeks to come, hopefully next week, maybe I'll get to the point where Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say take up my cross. He didn't say emulate my cross. He said take up your cross. See, this is the challenge in our society is that we don't want to bear the cross. We just want to experience the resurrection. And there is no resurrection without a death. That's why Paul said, I die every day. Every day, every day, every day. This is not every week. It's not every Sunday. I went to a church where every Sunday people made their way to the altar and wept for everything they did the previous six days. He said, boy, it felt good. Well, if it felt so good on Sunday, why didn't you do it on Friday? Amen. Wednesday, Tuesday. And let me tell you why. Because when we get in the presence of God, it makes us start thinking about the life of God around us or within us or outside of us. So to me, when I see a cross, it reminds me of the great price that was paid. It's written that on Interstate 77 that runs through Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, that there are three crosses erected along that highway. One of them says, 
or portrays a thief dying in his sin, the other a thief dying to his sin, and another Jesus dying for our sin. We know that Christ died for our sin, but you remember the one thief that looked at Jesus and said, remember me today when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus' response was, today you shall be with me in paradise. No baptism, no new members class, no nothing, but an acknowledgement I'm hanging on a cross that I deserve to be hanging on, but this man has done nothing. He's done nothing wrong, and yet he's hanging in the center of two robbers. What was happening that day was that those who hanged him on a tree, and this has obviously been an argument for a long time now, were trying to not only take Jesus' life physically, but in that moment, they were attacking his legacy and his credibility. When you hang a man between two robbers, you are implying this man, too, deserves to be hung on a tree. You see, people can do this to you all they want. They can put you in whatever situation you want, whatever group or category they want to try to put you in. But the real truth stands out when you're willing to say today, I die to self. I die to everything I want to live for, and the only way that it's going to live is if we die. According to John chapter 12, unless a seed falls down or to the ground and dies, it cannot produce. It produces much fruit, one seed, when it dies. Jesus knew he was the seed that had to die to produce many seeds called mankind. It would be wonderful to not have to preach on the cross. Preparing for this week. It's probably the most difficult week of 2019. Because there's not a lot sexy about the cross. <laughs> this isn't. How do you dress it up? How do you make it look better? How can it be so entertaining? And I love entertaining communication. I just couldn't find any way to entertain you. Because when I think about this, I think about what's required of me. And how so many times I fail in that requirement. But the cross had to happen to break the curse. Many people are waiting for Jesus to return in order to have the kingdom of God near or resident. But the reality is, in this moment, there was a shift in authority and power. When Christ returns, there will be a transition, not a shift. You no longer have to live under the dominion of darkness. Maybe we ought to have more crosses in our homes and our churches. We don't even have one in here. One. We need crosses to remind us of the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf, not just to send us to heaven. You see, most religious people have a mindset of, I want to go to heaven, and I appreciate that. But the cross brought heaven to earth. Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys. He told the disciples, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you authority. And yet every day we walk in weakness and defeat because we forget our divine nature. The very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says, will quicken your mortal body. That means in a time or a moment of desperation, we have the divine nature and the divine power to do the right thing. But we have to look to and pull on 
the cross. Jesus said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. You can't be the servant of all without dying to your need for accolades and affirmation. I'm in a field as a pastor throughout the years. People, and I was telling Susan this the other day, I said, so many people have lived vicariously through a preacher or a leader. You look at us and you think, if I can just hang near that person, I can live vicariously through their success. The problem with living vicariously through someone else's success means that you have to vicariously live through their failure. In the Old Testament, Israel looked around at other nations. Other nations had kings. God had given Israel judges. It just simply said these are a group of people, not one man, but a group of people that would hear the the complaints or the grievances of Israel and try to make some sort of judgment, kind of arbitrators, if you will, but not kings. But Israel was not satisfied, and they begged God to give them a king, and God did. And from that point on, things never went really well. Because it never works well. There's only one king, and his name is Jesus. No one else can ever be a king. You can call them what you want to call them. You can give them all the names and accolades you want. But the reality is the greatest position for any of us is the position of a servant. As much as I love being your pastor, I would really hate being your master. And that's exactly how it works when we don't understand the cross. The one who was the king of kings and lord of lords hung on a tree denying himself the privilege of being the son of God in that moment, becoming fully man as well as fully God and giving his life so that we could have life, not just eternal life, but abundant life. The cross reminds me of promise. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus knew for 30 years, 33 years of his life, at least when he became old enough to think and know, you got to wonder, a one-year-old Jesus was probably pretty clever. You know, he could, he probably, if he wanted to, he could have talked. You know what I'm saying? He could have said, hey, Mom, that's just really not going to work right now. <laughs> but for 33 years of his life, his focus was on the cross And before Jesus ever died a physical death, think about how many deaths he died up to the cross. Temptation, try to make him king. Things that came against him. And he said, what got him crucified was he said, you can destroy this temple and I'll build it again in three days. They thought he was talking about the temple of Jerusalem and he was talking about his body. You can kill me. You can destroy this body. You can destroy this temple. But in three days, it will be rebuilt. Of course, they're looking and saying that's impossible. But Jesus made a promise, and on the third day, we know he rose from the dead. But prior to that third day, he became a public spectacle to all so that you and I would not have to be a public spectacle. He disarmed the powers of darkness. I almost think when Jesus made the statement, I could call 12 legions of angels. It's almost like I can see an NFL game and one player taunting another that Jesus is literally taunting Satan in that moment. Because in that moment, I believe Satan realized he had overplayed his hand by convincing somebody to nail Jesus to the tree. And I think Satan probably had remembered the words written that uh, were written in Galatians 3, 9, so Those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. You remember what Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish or to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. 
So now, though you and I can never keep the law, we can never read it and do it. We cannot. But we can see it and work through it because of Jesus. Because he said, I fulfilled it. Now we don't live by the written code any longer, for the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. All of this is happening on the cross. Everything I'm talking about, the transition, the, 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 the shift, the power, the divine nature, all of it's happening on the cross, not in the tomb, not in the empty tomb, but in that moment, God is playing his, it's like a theater, God's playing this before the people. And can you imagine, it's like a mini series. When Jesus said it's finished, there were those going, there has to be an episode two. Maybe even an episode three. Quite frankly, I think there have been millions of episodes lived through people of who Jesus is, what he did, and what he did for us. Every day I feel like I'm a living episode, not a living epistle. And there are days the episode doesn't end well. And you say, man, I sure hope there's another episode. And everybody's watching saying, I'm sure hoping there's another episode. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them which means he will also be judged by them. If that is the standard that you follow, not the standard of the cross, but you follow the standard of the law, then you will be judged by the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that, listen to this, that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Galatia. Paul's a full-blown Jew, a Jew of Jews, and he's telling everybody this had to happen to include the Gentiles. And without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement or remission for sin, that Christ had to die. Have any of you, probably not, ever had someone curse you? I remember getting a letter from some Wiccan group here in town inviting me to some kind of witchcraft seance with a burned card around it. I've been told I was cursed, and I thought, wow, you need to hear my message on the cross. The curse has been broken. Your family has a history genetically of heart disease. The curse is broken. You have a curse on your family that generational curse is what they called it, passed down to generations. Genetically, the curse was broken on the cross. Curse of insanity, the curse of schizophrenia, the curse of bipolar was broken on the cross. And the divine nature of God through the divine power of God has been made, made available to work in our lives. We still continue to see behavior and things happening in our world that are a reflection of the curse. However, it has been broken and we have the power to live free from that curse. Why don't we? Primarily ignorance. Have you ever heard the phrase, ignorance is bliss? The person who said that is not ignorant. They're stupid. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance can cost you your life. Not knowing can cost you your life. I recently in USA Today read the 10 places you do not want to swim. And I thought, I could probably name three or four, but ten? I'm thinking you don't swim where there are alligators or crocodiles or hippos. Not a problem in the USA. 
But then I started reading some things in there that made me go, wow, I had no idea. And so what, how many people, and let me just say this, we're from Oklahoma. Some of you have never been to the beach. You don't even know what a riptide is. I'll never forget my first riptide. I was at Huntington Beach with a friend of mine preaching from Manhattan Beach in California, and all of a sudden the lifeguards began screaming, get out of the water. And I was in the water. I'm from Oklahoma. <coughs> but I thought, what the heck, I'll get out of the water. <clears throat> when I got out of the water, I said, what's up? Because I never, you know, I never swam in the ocean before. I'm from Oklahoma. We don't have oceans. We have dirty lakes. And you can try to beautify them all you stinking want to, but they're stinking dirty lakes. Logs floating around along with everything else imaginable. So I began doing my research on riptides. And I realized when they told me a riptide begins to pull you out, it, it sucks you out into the ocean. So I said, well, what do you do if you accidentally miss the riptide and there's not a lifeguard? I want to know because that's very possible. You know what I'm saying? And so I began to get educated. I'm no longer ignorant. If there's a riptide, let me help you. If you go to the ocean, swim parallel to the beach, out of it, because the whole thing's not. It's typically in certain locations. I just saved some of your lives. Ignorance can kill you. People who don't know the power of the cross, the divine nature of God, and the divine power of God, live under the authority of their own personalities, emotions, and ignorance. It doesn't mean that we'll live 100% kingdom, 100% of God all the time. But what this means is when you're in a funk, you're in a riptide emotionally, mentally, Swim parallel to the beach. Don't exhaust yourself trying to get back to the beach against a wave that is so much stronger than your capacity. The challenge is that when we find ourselves in that place, we often try, try to fight ourselves out of that place instead of maneuver ourselves out. That's where you take up your cross. You say, God, I will follow your way. I'm going to close with this story that I found very interesting, and this was another story that I went, wow, I had no idea how this university got started. In 1884, a young man died, and after the funeral, his grieving parents decided to establish a memorial in his name. With that in mind, they met with Charles Eliot, the then president of Harvard University. Eliot received the unpretentious couple into his office and asked what he could do for them. After they expressed their desire to fund a memorial at Harvard, Eliot impatiently said, perhaps you have in mind a scholarship because as he looked at them, they didn't appear to have any money. The parents responded, we were thinking of something more substantial than that, perhaps a building named in the honor of our son. In a patronizing tone, Eliot brushed aside the idea as being too expensive and the couple left his office. The next year, Elliot learned that his plain pair of people, mom and dad, had gone elsewhere and established a $26 million memorial named Leland Stanford Junior University, better known today as Stanford University. You've got the president of Harvard University so ignorant that he will not entertain a couple of unpretentious people because they don't look right. And his ignorance cost him $26 million, which in today's money would have been hundreds of millions, all because he refused to listen. The Bible says without knowledge we perish. Without an understanding of what the cross means and, and the power that it releases, not just the symbol that it stands for, but the power that is released in the cross for you and I to rise above sin and sin's authority in our lives. Every day you can look and say, Jesus, today I'm looking to the cross. I'm looking to the cross. I'm looking to the cross. As we approach Easter, I'm going to ask the ushers here in a little bit to give you an Easter card. Let me say this to you. 
There are people today, and there may be those of you among us and those of you watching, you love God and you know God loves you, but you don't know that the power of God is resident in you. All you've had, all the information that you have possessed has told you, I've accepted Christ in preparation for eternal life. Instead, I want to accept Christ so that I can bring the power of heaven to earth in my life. For so many years, I lived in a very wonderful religious home. Parents who revered God and more often were afraid of God but revered God and knew the authority of God but didn't know that the authority of God could be resident in their lives. Now, my mother prayed. I've got her Bible. My name's in there more than all my brother's. She cried out to God, but I never heard the power of confession. I heard the need to plead. Instead of rising up and knowing who you are in Christ through the cross, you beg him. You are not a beggar. You're a son and a daughter of God created in his image and his likeness. And that you don't have to beg. Ask any one of your children who really know that they belong to you. They will not one time ask you if they can get in the refrigerator or the pantry. Whatever's in there is theirs as far as they're concerned. Why? Because they're your children. I've never had one of my kids go, can I please have a piece of bread, daddy? Woe is me. Help me have a little burger today. They'd be looking and saying, where's the steak up in here? Why? Because you made them know that whatever was yours is theirs. God sent Jesus to say, whatever is mine is yours. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son not just to point to heaven, but to hang on a cross so that we could go to heaven and so that heaven could come to us. May the cross be a symbol we see every time our eyes are closed. It's not a cross of condemnation. It's a cross of liberation. It sets us free, which is what it was designed to do and still does today as we embrace it instead of run from it, as we acknowledge it as the symbol of our salvation. God, help us to not just go to the cross once a day, once a week, once a month. But may we live on the cross that we carry every day. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there are those of you today that, like so many of us in past years, ran from the love of God that we saw by way of the cross of Christ, not deserving of a love that the very Son of God would demonstrate by offering up His life for my life and knowing I did not deserve it and I still don't. And I never will. So when I see that cross, that symbol, it's not religious to me. It's life-giving. I want to pray a prayer that brings freedom to those of you who are still living your life under the curse, the bondage of the fall of mankind thousands of years ago, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior is to also receive His divine nature that comes with His divine power, that you no longer have to live under the circumstances, you can live above them. You no longer have to stay down. When you fall down, you can rise up. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, to die on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I confess you are my Lord and my Savior. Amen.
Those of you who prayed that prayer watching online and those of you who prayed it in-house here, I want you both to do the same thing. I want you to get your cell phone out, and I want you to text SAVED to 405-500-1310. 405-500-1310. Just text the word SAVED. Watch and see the feeling you get. That's how come we can't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Our confession, we cannot be ashamed And that by texting, what you're saying is, I am not ashamed to confess today that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. So please text SAVE to 405-500-1310. At this time, I want to receive our tithes and our offerings. And I want to, again, remind you that as you leave today, please make your way. Just walk by the garage, as we call it, and look inside and they'll write, their doors will be raised, and you can just kind of see what we're about to unleash. We're putting audio, video equipment up. It'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, there'll be some design graffiti on the walls for the kids. Uh, we got to get chairs in there. There's so many things we have to do, and and uh, it it ended up being a real faith project that so many of you stepped up and helped my faith, and I appreciate it. And we still need more, but we're just taking it a step at a time, and want you to see it. Uh, also, men, I want to remind you that this Wednesday night is our men's fellowship, 7 o'clock. Please be here. Uh, it will mean so much to you, your family, your spouse, the kingdom of God, and to your pastor to have you here on Wednesday night. Look forward to seeing you. Uh, if you want to give today, uh, you can help give. Uh, first off, I want to encourage you to tithe. That's always the big thing because that's just what we do. The Bible says that if we don't, we're robbing God. You don't want to rob God. You want to tithe. You want to give a 10%. And that's the most important. You realize if everybody gave 10%, we would never need more money to, for a project. You realize that. But some of you say, well, I'm going to give 10%, but I'm giving to that project. And we appreciate that. But really what I would love to see the body of Christ do is for everybody to say, I'm going to give a tenth of my income. And, and that if we did that, I promise you the body of Christ would be wealthier than Bill Gates and any other wealthy person put together. And so God's put in our hands the ability to make a difference. I pray that you'd make that difference today. Uh, uh, if you want to write a check, just write it to Mosaic. You don't have to put it Mosaic Church, OKC, okay, just Mosaic. If you want to give by cash, there's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you. So us just go ahead and pass the buckets if you would, please. Those of you that would like to text to give, 405-546-2226. Text the word GIVE to 405-546-2226. You can do this at home. You can do it from anywhere you want to be, uh, anywhere you are. And so uh, if you want to set it up, it may be easier to set it up at home, but some of you may have one of your children sitting next to you, and they can set it up in a matter of seconds. Remember how we used to not be able to set the VCR time because our kids could? Now we're to the place where they have to help us with apps. And uh, so anyway, you can set that up at home, but just text give and the amount and then you'll get a text back from Kindred, which states that you've given that amount. And if you have remorse, I believe you can even take it back. <laughs> it's really sad. <laughs> Every night you want to take it back? I mean, I don't know what it says, but something like that. And so anyway, we hope you don't want to take it back. But if you have to, you have to. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, those of you who are here for the very first time, we have a gift for you at the welcome kiosk in the lobby as you exit to your right. And I uh, want to encourage you to stop by there and pick it up. Uh, you'll remember us when you're drinking hot coffee. Let's just go there. Every church's go-to is a coffee mug with their name on it, and we're no different. Maybe we'll come up with something new soon. I don't know. But please. Yeah, it's just because you want to be a guest again and get whatever it is. I get it. Okay. No, we didn't do that for everybody. So if you would, stand to your feet. We're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday night, men, women. Uh, a week from Wednesday, Beth Moore Bible Study, incredible. You want to make plans to be here 10 days in advance, and, and don't let anything, you know, butt you out of that, all right? Well, let's go out with a shout. One, two, three.